Welcome to Bullshift the Podcast. My name is John DeGuy. I'm the host of the podcast and the author of the book Bullshift. This is a podcast that talks about behavioral economics in general with a specific emphasis on optimism bias, which is when the financial services industry shifts your attention to being bullish. Welcome. My guest this week is Dilip Soman, who is the, uh, the uh, co-editor of the book Behavioral Finance in the Wild. And there are so many other things that I can tell you about Professor Soman. Here we go. He is the Canada Research Chair in Behavioral Science and Economics at the Rotman School of Business at the University of Toronto. He has degrees in behavioral science, marketing and engineering, and is interested in the applications of behavioral science and organizations for welfare and for policy. He is the co-author of Managing Customer Value, the author of The Last Mile, which is a great book that I've read, the co-author of The Behavioral Informed Investor, the Behavioral Informed Organization, and once again, Behavioral Science in the Wild, which was just released last year. He has taught in the USA, Hong Kong, and Canada, and has worked with several corporations, governments, and startups, and his non-academic interests include things like procrastination, cricket, travel, and taking weekends seriously. Professor Soman, how are you? I am doing really well. Thank you so very much. And thank you for highlighting all of my non-academic interests. They're the ones that keep me going. It's it's great. I've, I've never met anyone who uh, makes procrastination a hobby and taking weekends seriously. Those are fantastic things to put into a bio. I love it. Well, thank you. I want to begin by talking about something that one of your mentors, Richard Thaler, helped to uh, sort of popularize the, the, the notion of a nudge. Uh, Thaler and Sunstein wrote a book to that effect and updated it a couple of years ago and talking about how we could purposely get people to do certain things that they might not otherwise do if, if left to their own devices. But one of the things that you have been talking about and, and Thaler and others is, is the, the new concept of sludge. Could you talk to me a little bit about what sludge is? Yeah, I mean, I, it's tempting to think about sludge as the evil cousin of nudge. I mean, nudge is something that helps people get things done, something that makes it easy. Sludge slows you down. Sludge makes it difficult. Sludge imposes friction. Um, and, and sludge shows up in a number of places where you don't want it to. So I'm going to give you a quick example of something that happened to me a a couple of years ago, I was on our favorite online bookstore, uh, the name of a river.com, uh, and I was buying a book. There was something pre checked while I was checking out. And before I knew it, I was getting copies of this newspaper that are based in New York showing up at my doorstep. And I like, I didn't, I didn't buy these. Uh, and of course, it took me a while to figure out how, what had happened is I had left that box checked when it, in fact, should have been unchecked. and. And so by default, I got, I guess, tricked into buying uh, that particular publication. And so I set about trying to cancel it. And I kid you not, Joey, this was not an easy thing to do. I started off by going to their website, and then I called them, and then I called them again. And then uh, I kept getting tossed around. And at some stage, I thought I had mastered the process. And finally, when they took down my address, they said, oh, you live in Canada. That's a completely different process for that. Um, and so six months later, I found myself having to mail in like a letter, like using a stamp and everything to request cancellation. And that's my prototypical example of a sludge. It's, a, it's an organization that really makes it hard for you to accomplish the kinds of things that you want to do. Now, it shows up in a number of different places. It shows up as needlessly complicated processes uh, that we put into place to make sure that our interests are guarded as an organization. But we don't think a lot about what that means for consumers. It shows up in communication that is needlessly complicated, i.e., think about legalese. Uh, it shows up as emotional spotlights where, for example, recipients of aid or welfare feel like they don't want to take it because now the whole world will know that they are welfare recipients. So sludge can take many forms. Uh, it is essentially friction is the way I think about it. Um, and before back to you, I, I do want to say not all friction is bad. I mean, sometimes you want friction, right? Think about think about a situation where you and your partner had a fight, uh, or and this could be a partner in life, it could be a partner in business, 
this is not a place where you want the Amazon one-click button to get divorced. Right? I mean, it's clearly a moment thing and put to cool down and reflect. And so, for example, we have cooling off periods in, in negotiations and contracts. And we have them because they allow people to reflect and they allow people to think about any stupid decisions that they might have made in the heat at the moment. So two things to, to wrap up this segment. Friction is bad, uh, but it turns out friction uh, has, has huge effects in preventing people from getting things done. And a lot of the things we see in the financial services industry, like, you know, why, why do people not, not consume advice? Uh, it's not because they don't think advice is valuable. It's the, the emotional spotlight of speaking to an advisor that I think drags people down. Why do people not uh, rebalance portfolios? Because there's you know, things to do and this is a procedure and it gets in the way. Or why do people not pay taxes on time. This, these are all things that can be explained by sludge. And, and to me, I think like if we spend the time as an industry clearing up sludge and making sure people can do what they want to do without much of a friction, uh, we will be a much better industry. Great. Well, amen to that, because uh, I think a lot of people say that they, they exist in order to make people's lives better. And then the, the thing about sludge is that it, it finds ways to, those frictions are in fact great impediments to, to enjoying life. Like it, it, it hangs over you that you couldn't cancel that health club membership or you couldn't cancel you know, that subscription and whatever it could be. It could be online streaming, whatever. And if it, if it makes it difficult or whatever, then it's just, oh my goodness, it just sort of hangs over this, you. This uh, peculiar tendency in today's corporate world, in particular in financial services, where we try and provide solutions to customers, to stakeholders, those solutions could take the form of, as, as I said, advice or financial literacy. Uh, and I always keep saying, why not focus the efforts on making the system a bit more easy to navigate rather than making it complex and having people now, you know, give it, giving them an agency or giving them some help in navigating the complexity. Let's just simplify the damn thing. Uh, and I think if we could do that, that would just be a game changer. I wanted to turn one more time. I'm going to hold it up again to your the book that you were the co-edited co-editor for behavioral finance in the wild, behavioral sorry behavioral fi science in the wild. What's the in the wild? What 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 exactly is the reference to in the wild? So um, I think in in the wild takes meaning context of the book. The first is from a scientific perspective, when we talk about taking ideas, taking demonstrations, taking experiments that we do in well-controlled pilot formats and then scaling them up uh, without the same level of control that we have in a lab. Uh, and what I mean by that is in the lab, we can make sure that people look at our stimulus or in, in, a, in a pilot project, we collect data to make sure people are reading our materials and they understand them. Whereas if you just launch a new product or a new program, we're not doing all of those things. And so when it gets into the wild, when it gets into unmeasured territory or uncharted territory, what actually happens to the results of our interventions? I guess that's part of the wild. Uh, but I think the other sense in which we talk about behavioral science in the wild is just the growth of the science and the growth of behavioral finance uh, is, is I think, there are a lot of challenges to the science, to sort of the science of understanding human behavior and applying it. And, um, and sometimes I and my fellow contributors worry that um, you know, this, this is happening without the kind of scientific rigor that we thought it should have. And so I think it's a, you know, the, the in the wild refers to both, both those settings. And I think simple story in the book is that stuff that works really well in a pilot essentially gets wat watered down in the wild. It, you don't get the same effects. You don't get the same impact of the effects. It doesn't reach as many people as you think it should reach just because of some of the things that we spoke about. So I'm wondering if I can connect the first two questions, the one about the nudge sludge and then the one about in the wild into something that I know you do that I don't want you to sort of divulge any state secrets, but I know that people like you uh, work with nudge units uh, in, in governments where you actually try to find a way to get in the wild to nudge people to do proper things. 
you don't have to, I'm not asking you to, to sort of uh, give away anything that's secret, but is, is there anything that you could maybe share as an example of how public policy is shaped using nudges with positive outcomes that we can do to make things better? So uh, th there are no state secrets. And I think one of the beauties uh, of working with the government units is the transparency. I've really enjoyed working with governments because everything we do is published. It's available on our website to look at. Yeah. And, 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 and so there are, there are no state secrets. I do want to make a couple of other comments before we jump into examples. I think one of the comments I want to make is the, the choice of the word nudge. Uh, and I know when Richard and Cass wrote their book, I think it was a publisher who suggested that they call it Nudge. Um, and, and while the, the beauty of the title is that it is catchy and simple, uh, it also suffers from the problem that it is a common word in the English language. And, and so people tend to use the word Nudge in a much broader sense than the authors meant it to be. So a lot of people will talk about Nudge as anything that influences people's choice. And I don't think that's the way they meant it, right? I like to use the term choice architecture. And, right. and, and what I mean by that is, are there things in the situation, in the context, and the way in which information is presented that can be changed to influence people's choices without actually changing the content of what is offered to them, right? And so at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's very similar in spirit to what most people think of as a nudge. But for example, uh, Advertising isn't a nudge. It's just advertising, right? I'm not changing anything about how the choice is offered. But if I present the same choices using different language, uh, that's a nudge. If I simplify a form, if I make the communication more streamlined, that's a nudge, etc. So the example that I do want to speak about, maybe I'll give you two very briefly. Uh, one in the domain of finance and one not. The one from the domain of finance is work we did with governments and units in uh, Mexico uh, on improving pension contributions. Mexico is an interesting case study. It's got 6.5% uh, mandatory uh, contributions uh, to pension, but government projections suggest that you need to set aside at least 11, 11.5%. And so we're looking for the extra five or so as voluntary contributions. And a completely different story as to why they don't change the law and they don't make it 11% mandatory. It's something that's on the table. Uh, but we were thinking about ways in which we could encourage people to make that extra, that extra contribution. Um, and it turns out the challenge is a lot of people just don't have a good sense of how much they need to save, right? And, and even if they did, they don't have a good competitive benchmark. So you could tell me today that my retirement cost today is dollars and I'm going to get a pension of Y based on that. Uh, is that good? Is that bad? Am I better than average? Uh, what's going to happen in the future of another time? I, I just don't have any of those insights. And I say I, I mean the average, the average Mexican. Uh, and so we just change the way in which that information is presented rather than giving them numerical projections. We gave them categories. We created four categories. A green zone, everything is going fine. Just keep doing what you're doing. It's a, it's a very action-oriented category. Orange, uh, you're almost there. Uh, just crank it up a little bit. And we gave people some very specific guidance on what that little bit is. Then there was a yellow zone, which is right direction, but a lot more work to be done. And then there was a red zone, which is kind of too late. Uh, right? Uh, and so that simple act of changing the way information was presented essentially woke people up. We basically, now they were saying, geez, now I need to say more, right? They hadn't thought about that before. Second thing we did was, uh, this, this is the oldest trick in the book. We just made the pension statement engaging and interesting, right? We, you've seen government forms, John, like they're, they're as dull as dishwater. We added color, we put visuals, we, uh, we basically got people to spend more time looking at their quarterly pension statements. And, and when you put these people uh, in an eye tracker where you can actually see what they're seeing, what they're looking at, you can see that they're now looking at that color thermometer that I just spoke about. They're looking at the zone, which, which zone am I in? Uh, and then their eye gaze shifts towards the information that they need to look at. Um, and so we were able to increase voluntary pensions in some cases by 80%, 90%, 
Uh, so big, big numbers by simply understanding the psychology of how people process information and how that communication should be changed. So that's 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 a simple yet compelling example. Uh, work we did in Ontario several years ago to improve the organ donation uh, rates in the province. Um, John, the thing is, a lot of us want to be organ donors. A lot of us stay for retirement. Uh, we just don't do it. Um, life gets in the way, right? Uh, and so a lot of the thrust of the interventions we design are just to help convert people's intentions into action. So people come into Service Ontario, they're waiting. You remember the drill back in the pre-pandemic days. Uh, and at the end of the transaction, you've renewed your driver's license. And then they ask you, would you like to be an organ donor? By this time, you spent 40 minutes. Uh, lunchtime is running out. You want to head back to the office or go back home. And you pretty much say no. right? Um, and knowing that you're going to say no, the agents never asked you uh, in, in many cases. We changed the system so that now as you enter Service Ontario, you get a form and a little leaflet that tells you the benefits of being an organ donor. There's information on the wall right next to where you're queuing up. Um, and so when you reach the agent, should you want to be an organ donor, all you're doing is completing a simple form. It's on a piece of card as opposed to paper. Uh, so that when the agent opens up your file to renew your driver's license, they already know that you're going to be an organ donor. And so they can simply copy and paste the information to the next form. Simple change in process, uh, massive improvements in organ donation. But again, I go back to the point I made earlier. Uh, I think the goal of choice architecture, as it is used by governments, isn't to trick people into doing things that they don't want. It isn't to get people to buy more things. It's really converting intention, intention to action. And so, you know, all of us have the best of intentions. If we can come up with interventions to convert them into actions, I'm all for supporting that sort of policy. It's funny because you're talking about the name of a book and nudges being something that, you know, choice architecture would have been a little more cumbersome name for that book. And libertarian paternalism would have been an even more cumbersome and academic sounding name for the book. Because I know that's what Richard was, was thinking about, he and Cass. It was actually libertarian paternalism is more than an oxymoron. It was a longer name. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, yeah. So uh, you can see how nudge works. And, and you can, it gives you a bit of an idea of, of why I chose Bullshift as, as the, as the t you know, title for my book as well. Because it's, it's catchy. It grabs people's attention. And yeah, it can be misconstrued, but I'll, I'll take that. I'd rather just get people's attention as they're browsing through the bookstore and, and, and then we can sort the other stuff out later. Um, could you, um, people think about behavioral economics as being um, exploiting irrationalities and thinking about how behavioral problems are problems that are rooted in irrationality. I'm wondering if you could perhaps take a moment to, to talk about the, the area where the industry is, is more rational than you think and areas where it's not and how we might be able, be able to maybe overcome whatever irrationalities we all suffer from. So I'll, I'll actually go back to the point you made about what people think about behavioral economics. You're right. I think a lot of people think about behavioral economics as a field that demonstrates irrationality, i.e. that people aren't very smart. Uh, and I don't subscribe to that. Theory. And, and so when you, when you think about when you think about where this is coming from, it's essentially a, a, a discrepancy between what a model of rationality says people should do versus what they should do. That's the gap. That's irrationality. Right. And you can correct the gap by two ways. You can actually get people to be, quote unquote, smarter and move them towards the normative model. Or you could change the damn model. Uh, and I'm a big subscriber to what I call the Depeche Mode School of Behavioral Science. Uh, Depeche Mode had a song called People Are People, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what they are. Uh, and so I think to expect people to be the super smart, rational, forward-looking, uh, emotionless automatons, that's just a non-starter, right? So to, to me, any firm, any manager, any organization that treats its stakeholders as econs, that's irrational, right? 
And, and, and so uh, I, I look back at the industry and say, well, where, where is it that we treat people as uh, as smarter than they are, and where it, where is it that we don't? And so there's there's many there's many ways in which we do that. There's you know we we impose belief structures on what people must want. Now people must want products that have a better interest rate. Well, guess what? Maybe they don't, right? Uh, or People must realize that an annuity is better than a lump sum because if you work out the math, uh, that's what it shows. And no, people don't work out the math and maybe they don't care as much uh, about receiving stable income or whatever that might be, right? And uh, we really need to think, or information, right? I mean, our, our best instrument in financial services is data. We give people data with the belief that giving them data is gonna change the way they behave. And it, that's not true. Uh, you know, sometimes you give people too, too much data and they use none of it at all. Because there's information overload. I'm wondering if you could, uh, I think you're familiar with the concept of a SIF, a uh, supposedly irrelevant factor. Uh, uh, I think I, a lot of what we're talking about here, sunk costs for tickets on a rainy day and that sort of thing are, are SIFs. And those are things that are, uh, some would say irrational, but in fact, it's just natural. People are people. Could you maybe take a moment to explain what a SIF is? Yeah, so uh, SIF stands for a supposedly irrelevant factor. When we think about what people ought to do, there are a bunch of things that we think shouldn't matter. Um, so the fact that we are speaking in the evening versus in the morning shouldn't change the conversation, but guess what it does? Uh, or the fact that people make investment decisions at the end of the a long work week in which they're tired and hungry uh, changes whether they invest in stocks versus bonds shouldn't matter. It does matter. Uh, judges who are making decisions uh, first thing in the morning take longer, deliberate longer. As they get towards lunch, are, are faster in their decision making. Physicians make more errors. Antibiotic prescriptions go up as the time of the day. So all of these are sifts, right? We we feel that these are things that shouldn't matter, but they do. And I think. Uh, the financial services industry needs to think long and hard about SIFs that actually influence how people make financial decisions. It's not about just knowing things. It's about understanding when uh, they make decisions and under what context. And I think that, that, is, the big, that is a big gap, I think. It's, it's funny because it's, there, this is an idea of noise here. Where you, you even have judges that will actually hand out different sentences based on whether or not their team went on the weekend, right? Uh, two different people. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. just ridiculous. Well, I mean, again, we, you can come up with a perfectly good story to explain yeah. why it happens. Uh, and so from that standpoint, it isn't. Right? <laughs> like today, you and I talking about this would sit back and say, well, why would it matter if somebody was, I don't know, inside a bank versus outside in terms of their intention to invest? Well, but now you, like, you can tell a story afterwards if it does matter, right? And I think that's what makes a SIF hard, is you only see it when it shows up when a decision is made. And then you look back and say, oh, geez, maybe it was because the guy was with his family or was on a vacation. And, and, and so they weren't thinking long and hard about the decision. Uh, but yeah, I mean, SIFs do matter. And I think in addition to, uh, to us helping our clients, for example, make better decisions, we should also help them figure out in what context and what situations should they make those decisions. And when should they not, right? So why do most people not rebalance their portfolios at the end of each year? Because they don't have to. Right. They don't have to, right? Uh, and, and we know people are cognitively lazy. They will not do things unless they have to do it. And so we worked with a company where said, you know, with, with HR is every year when you log back in for the first time, maybe just put up a little button which says, uh, do you want to you know, rebalance your portfolio, portfolio. Look at your investment choices, or no, I don't care, even if I leave money on the table. It's actually good to do it at the beginning of the year because that way you can tax optimize and defer your taxes as well. So if you're going to do it, do it, do it on the first of the year as opposed to your birthday. But so, this is it. And, 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 and so if we actually choose the right timing with simple interventions like these little radio buttons where people will tell you, no, I'm an idiot by not rebalancing. Uh, they will rebalance. Uh, so I, I think the timing matters. I think the context matters. 
One of the things that's great about, I think, about being a prof uh, like yourself is you get to deal with a lot of bright young people and you've been teaching behavioral economics almost as long as anyone in Canada. And I'm wondering if you could share with the people that are listening in today, uh, what you think are perhaps some of the more rewarding elements of, of teaching bright young people about behavioral economics? I think the sense of wonder that they have when they realize that this stuff applies to everything is amazing. I, and, and so I talk about simple principles like overconfidence or framing effects and, uh, you know, empathy. And people are like, oh, yeah, uh, you know, I worked as a nurse practitioner and I saw examples of that. And somebody else worked as a wealth manager and they saw that. And a third person worked in government and they saw that. And so I think just the ability to connect the dots across different domains where this applies, I think. Because I've actually seen people with a much broader set of backgrounds who are now putting their hands up and like, yeah, I wish I knew that. Uh, or I think my industry can benefit from that. That number is growing. And I think that's fabulous. Where do you see the industry going, the behavioral finance industry in the next few years? It's, it's interesting because I, I do think there is now we've reached a point where it's become, dare I say, mainstream. And people are now talking about it as not as some funky thing that that happens as a, as a sidebar, uh, but rather uh, something that is there are dozens of books about, you know, behavioral finance. Where do you think we'll, we'll be going in the next 10 or 12 years? I, I, I do think it's going to grow. I do think the range of applications is, is going to grow. So you can look at the, the low-hanging fruit at this point in time is communications, for example, or segmentation, right? So all of our major banks, or at least many of them have behavioral teams now. They all use those behavioral teams for different things. So TD Wealth, for example, their efforts are more in thinking through segmentation and does personality affect the way in which you make choices? And can I customize my messages to you uh, as a function of that? Scotiabank is applying it more for compliance uh, behavior changes. RBC is doing something else. And, and so just looking across our banks and financial industry in general, I think you can see the breadth of application areas, which I find fascinating. And so I do think we're going to reach a point in time where everybody's going to be doing everything because they're going to learn from each other. Um, Richard always uh, said the following about behavioral economics. He was asked, when would you consider behavioral economics a success? And he said, that would happen if we don't use the term behavioral anymore to describe economics. And I think finance, I would yeah. argue, is the same thing. When we get to a point which is not too far away where everybody recognizes that at the end of the day, finance is about a bunch of actors that are human or c comprised of humans um that's that's success and and wow. that that day i don't think is too far away good uh thank you uh we've run out of time so we just have to wrap up with the way we end all of these different uh segments which is the two things that i talk about all the time that's bullshift and shift happens so that's bullshift is when i invite my guests to point to something that they think could be done better in the financial services industry. What, what if you, if there was something that you think could be done better, what would that be? I think it is the um, emphasis or, or, or the lack of emphasis on helping clients make better choices. That's something we could definitely do much in a much better way. Okay, and then if if that's the problem, how would you solve it? Shift happens. If if it were up to Dilip Solman, how would how would we help people make better choices? So I think shift would happen by moving resources away from knowledge to decision making, from educating to facilitating, from moving away from from navigating, helping people navigate complex choices to actually simplifying the choices in the first place. Well, wow, that's great. It, it, you know, it's funny because. That, that's elegant and, and short, and yet it's really inspirational because when you think about it, if you could actually make simple choices that are more in keeping with what are, what, what's beneficial for you, what's optimal, that's a win-win. You, know, you, 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 you got to a better place and it took less time and effort to get there. So it's, it's wonderful to do that. So that's great. Terrific. Dilip, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure, and I want to wish you all the success in the world and all the other things you're doing right now. I know Likewise, you're a man. thank you, and all the best to Bullshift, uh, not just the podcast, but the book as well. Great. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye now. John DeGuey is a portfolio manager in Toronto and the author of the book Bullshift, How Optimism Bias Threatens Your Finances. 
Full Shift is available online and in bookstores everywhere. The opinions expressed in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Bullshit, the podcast, is produced by TalkShoe, a division of IOTUM.